Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kadir. I'm a product manager with Amazon Simple Email Service. Today, we have Christopher Bull from Amazon.com, and we also have Jonathan Burkett from Duolingo here to share their experiences with Amazon SES. Before we dive in, I want to give you a quick overview of what you're going to get today. We are going to talk about why Amazon SES, followed by Duolingo and Amazon Retail going to talk about how they are using SES and how they are sending and scaling their email infrastructure. And I, in the second half of this presentation, we are going to talk about the deliverability of the emails, the likelihood of the emails going to land in the inbox versus in a junk folder. That is more important and critical part of a scalable email infrastructure. Before we go in, I want to talk about why emails first. When I joined this, when I joined the team, Amazon SES, I was asked, my friends asked me, uh, when customers, some of the customers asked me as well, why email? I started doing some more research, and then I realized everyone have an email address. And more than 60% of those customers, they check their emails at least once every day. And then of those people who check their emails every day, they also do that from their mobile. They are attached to their emails. They are connected to their emails. And a lot of these customers are actually want to receive emails from their brand. For example, I am learning French using Duolingo app. And couple of days, if I, don't, if I get busy, if I don't get any uh, uh, training in, I get an email from Duolingo that prompts me, nudges me, say, okay, go take five-minute classes. And that's really important. That's more relevant, more personalized. And I wanted to get that so I can go take the lesson and keep up with my French classes, right? So that's more important. Customers are looking for that kind of level of emails and uh, personalization from the customers, from their companies. And it's targetable. You can target who you want to send to, who will be reading those emails, who will be uh, interacting with those emails. And it's also easy to measure as well using clicks and click through or open rates and click throughs and also the action they take after they do the click throughs. You'll be able to target them and measure whether your email is effective and is engaging to your customers. And our enterprise customers, our businesses, they are telling us that it's core to their business. It's re very relevant. A lot of our customers, they say, uh, they see more return on the investment using email, and they also have more uptake and conversions than other mediums, such as social media. But, so email is important, but managing it and doing it is a lot of work. First, you need to start installing the email server, then you need to do the patches, and you need to understand how you need to classify the bounces, and also some plans to do the feedback uh, notification and, and loops from many of the top vendors, uh, main block providers in the world. And as you start building it up and scaling it, you need to start, uh, when you start looking at adding more scale, uh, adding IPs, you need to warm them up. You need to start, it keeps adding up. And most importantly, you need to start tracking how your customers are doing, whether your IP addresses are getting blacklisted. So it's a lot of work. And it's taking you away from your own business where you can build more meaningful experience for your customers and then delight them in, instead of doing this undifferentiated heavy lifting. That's where Amazon SES comes in. Amazon SES is an email sending service. You can also receive emails through Amazon SES as well. Whether you are sending 10 emails or uh, 10,000 emails or 10 million emails in a given day, Amazon will scale for you. And also we have features that will work for all of you. We launched uh, three new regions earlier this year. We are now in, available in Frankfurt, Bombay, and in Sydney, in addition to other three regions, uh, Dublin, US, East one, Virginia, and then also uh, Portland as well. So it's there. There is a scale. You can use it across the world and be in compliance with many of the legislative requirements. And we also have many features that we have launched over the course of the last couple of years that will help you scale up, that will help you build a meaningful and uh, scalable email sending solution. We keep providing, we, every day we give recommendations to our customers on how to build scalable uh, email solutions. But we thought it would be pretty interesting to have a couple of our customers to come in and tell, uh, tell you guys how they have actually built it and how they are scaling their email sending. So we have Duolingo today and Amazon.com here to, to share their stories on how they have built uh, a scalable email infrastructure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm a senior software engineer at Duolingo. And I want to give you a quick overview today of how Duolingo uses Amazon SES at scale to send millions of emails a day to uh, our customers to keep them engaged in learning a new language. 
So for those of you who uh, might not know Duolingo, the mission of Duolingo is to make high quality language learning education universally accessible. And one of the ways we do that primarily is through the Duolingo app, which you can see some screenshots of here. Um, currently, actually, the Duolingo app is the number one most downloaded education app worldwide. And I think one of the reasons it's so successful is how engaging the content is. We work really hard uh, to make sure that the language lessons at Duolingo are fun and engaging and not like a chore. And we are actually now up to over 300 million different users learning a new language uh, at Duolingo, either through the app or on our website, duolingo.com. And we actually also now offer 38 different languages over 90 different courses. This even includes some fictional languages now, so like the uh, fictional Klingon language from Star Trek. And I'll leave it to you to see if you can spot the, uh, the flag for that language on this slide. Anyway, moving on to email specifically, uh, Duolingo has used Amazon SES since launching back in 2012, which is actually not much later than SES itself was launched. And in that time since its launch, we have found SES to be reliable, easy to use, and cost efficient. Uh, and it's helped us to scale from having a, a customer base of several hundred users to several hundred million users. And perhaps most importantly, we found that we've had very few reputation issues using Amazon SES, which means that we spend very little time managing our reputation and more time thinking about what emails we want to send and when we want to send them. So here's a quick overview of some of the different types of emails we send at Duolingo. So on the far left is, is our most common email. It's a daily practice reminder, which we send to active users to encourage them to do their daily Duolingo lessons that day. Um, we also have a number of special emails. So for example, users on Duolingo have a streak, which is how many days they've consecutively done lessons. And if they miss a day, they can keep their streak by using a streak freeze item. And if, when they use items like that, we also send them an email to encourage them to come back to complete their streak, but also maybe to get another streak freeze item. We also have emails like a weekly report that we send to users summarizing the progress in the app that week. And finally, we have a number of special emails we send to e uh, users to surprise them. So for example, on a user's Duoversary, which is the anniversary of the day they signed up with Duolingo, we send them a, a happy Duoversary email, which I think users like. So here's a quick breakdown of the different types of emails we send to Duolingo. About half of the emails we send, and this is since the beginning of the year, about half the emails we send are those practice reminders I mentioned earlier. Uh, about a quarter are newsletters, which are emails we send to people updating them on new features that we've launched or new courses that are available. And then 15% are those weekly emails I mentioned earlier. And then that last 10% is the kind of common emails everybody sends, like password reset emails, uh, registration confirmation, that sort of thing. But what's interesting about this is that we have a number of different use cases here. So the practice reminders, we more or less send the same volume of those every day and at the same time. But the newsletters, we only send on special occasions, and when we do send newsletters, we tend to send them to almost all users. So we need to be able to handle the use case where we have to scale up really rapidly to send, say, 50 million emails in a single day for, in the case of newsletters. And so to this end, we ended up designing a service to wrap around the S, uh, SES in order to manage all the emails that we send at Duolingo. And this is a, a chart of that here. We call this the notify service. And we've actually been using this uh, for, for many years now at Duolingo. Um, so to give you an idea of how this works, if we look on the left there, we have three different queues that services at Duolingo can add emails to. Uh, and they have different levels of priority. So you can imagine the high priority queue, we put things that need to be sent right away that are time critical. So things like password reset emails should go in the high priority uh, queue. In the medium priority queue, we leave things that are time sensitive but not time critical. So for example, your daily practice reminder, we wanna make sure it's sent within some time window today, but it's not absolutely urgent that it gets sent. Finally, we have low priority emails, things like newsletters that we wanna get out eventually, but it doesn't really matter if they happen right this moment. Then we have a fleet of ECS tasks that read from these queues to process the emails. And you'll note that naturally we give the most number of tasks to the high priority queue. But there are other advantages to having these separate queues beyond just being able to allocate work independently. For example, if we suddenly send out a huge number of newsletters, if it was all in one queue, then you could imagine we might actually starve uh, the password reset emails that are time sensitive by having so many newsletters. So keeping them in separate buckets is actually very advantageous. 
Finally, uh, one of the other things we do is it's important that we don't ever send emails to the same user, the same email to the same user multiple times. So we have kind of a fail safe cache layer here at the end that checks to see whether this email has been sent to that user within the past 24 hours. So actually, in general, we tell uh, people sending emails using this service that they are responsible for doing their own deduplication. But because it's such a challenge, we've also found that we want a kind of defense in depth strategy where we have this extra cache. Finally, the email gets sent out using Amazon SES. We also tend to send uh, push notifications at the same time, but I won't be talking too much about that in this presentation. So I want to hone in a bit more on those practice reminders that I think are kind of the hallmark email we send at Duolingo. Um, what's interesting about these is that we found over time that these are critical for user retention. Uh, they really keep users engaged because they remind users that in order to make progress towards their goals of learning a new language, they need to be doing lessons on a pretty frequent basis. Um, but what we want to be doing with these is making sure that we deliver them in a prompt, uh, a prompt way. So if a user likes to study in the afternoon, we want to make sure they get that email in the afternoon when they're going to be, uh, that's their time for studying. And finally, users don't like getting reminders if they've already completed a lesson that day. So if a user completes a lesson, we want to make sure we cancel the email that's scheduled to be sent to them. Um, so in order to achieve these goals, we built another service called the Comeback Service, Comeback being Come Back to Duolingo. And to give you an idea of how this works, I want to talk about some different infrastructure at Duolingo. So throughout Duolingo, we have a lot of different SNS topics. These SNS topics get sent events when users do all sorts of different things, when they log in, when they complete lessons, et cetera. And different services, like the comeback service, can subscribe to different SNS topics to get different updates about what things are happening with users. So in this case, we take all of those uh, different SNS topic events and combine them into a single queue that gets consumed by the service. Then the event worker looks for these events and takes appropriate actions. So the most common thing that happens here is when a user completes a lesson, we see an event go by and then we say, aha, we should schedule an event for that, uh, a re practice reminder for that user the next day. We actually have a fun heuristic that is, if a user completes a lesson at a certain time, we schedule their practice reminders for 23 and a half hours in the future, which we have discovered over time is like the magic number for reminding people. It gives them some extra time to kind of check their email and think about it. And then once that half an hour has passed, we're right on when they probably would be wanting to do it. So it's important that we get that, that schedule down based on that. But we've also experimented with other types of things like trying to infer what type of schedule a user might want that's different than that 23 and a half hour heuristic. And we do that kind of logic here. So as I mentioned, we schedule the reminder and we put it in our database, which we use Aurora for. Uh, it's pretty simple. We just say what time we want to send the email, what email we're sending, and the relevant user ID. Now at the same time, we have a separate worker that is looking at this database and saying, uh, well, it's 2 p.m. now, or whatever time it is. Are there any emails that I should be sending from this database? So this is looking for what practice reminders should be sent. And if it sees any, it adds them to a second queue in the service. Finally, we have a worker that pulls things out of that queue, and then prepares the email to be sent to the user. So while it will take out like the practice reminder template, it needs to instantiate it for the user by filling it in with their name, what language they're learning, appropriate links, that sort of thing. And we do that by talking to the Duolingo API, and there's a nice caching layer in between it, so it doesn't constantly have to talk to the API with uh, new requests each time. And finally, uh, when the email's ready to go, we hand it off to that notify service I mentioned earlier. Now, what's cool about this, uh, this service is that it allows us to handle some of those special practice reminder use cases I mentioned earlier. So say, for example, a user want, changes their email configuration, so they no longer want to get practice reminders. Well, we have this big cache in front of the API, so by default, our API calls will not actually be updated for that user necessarily to say that they don't want to receive practice notifications anymore. But because we have this system of SNS topics where events are passed into our service, we can actually see when a user changes uh, their email configuration settings as a SNS topic event, and then we can consume that and then delete the appropriate emails from the database so that they don't get sent to that user. And the same logic applies if a user completes a lesson that day. If they complete a lesson already for that day, we can just go in and, and cancel their practice reminder. And we use this kind of event-driven system to do that. One final thing, I mentioned earlier that we had those duoversary emails that are sent once a year. Well, you can imagine actually that an anniversary email is actually not too dissimilar from a practice reminder just kind of scheduled with year granularity rather than day granularity. So we found that this tool, which we designed to be for practice reminders, was actually fairly extensible and could be used for other types of, of periodic emails we wanted to send as well. 
All right, I want to change gears a bit and talk less about how we send emails and talk about the content of the emails we send. Uh, so some of you may have seen these emails before. These are, again, the copies of the, the practice reminder emails. And I noticed while I was preparing this presentation that actually the content of this email has been more or less the same over the, the seven years we've been doing this. I, there's this bit about how learning a language requires practice every day and a kind of a guilt trip bit for that uh, you should keep our owl mascot duo happy by completing lessons. And, uh, and one of the reasons I think we struggle to, to constantly iterate on these is because of the challenges uh, involved in evaluating them. So, for example, normally when we make changes in the Duolingo app, we do it through an A-B test. So we test two different things, measure the effectiveness of one versus the other, and whichever one wins, we go with that. So suppose, for example, that we wanted to iterate on the subject line of our practice reminder email. We might have two different ones we were considering, like learning French requires daily practice, practice now, versus got five minutes, time for a tiny French lesson. And what we would do is give you know, half the, the users one of these messages and half the users the other message. And then we check, well, which one has the higher open rate? So in this case, the one on the right outperformed the one on the left. So we say, okay, we're going to go with that one, the one on the right now forever. But that's not necessarily an ideal strategy because you can imagine that for all of these emails, they actually come in a lot of different languages. And it might be the case that uh, like a guilt trippy kind of message versus an encouraging message have different sort of meanings in different languages. So it's, it's hard to make decisions for all languages based on a single A-B test. So maybe we need multiple A-B tests, but that could be potentially a lot of work. Another thing that's relevant in the email space is the novelty effect. So we know that users, when they see messages they haven't seen before or messages they haven't seen recently, are more likely to engage with that content. So if we just pick one winner and stick with that, then we might actually be missing out on, on the ability to kind of surprise users with more new messages. So I guess what I'm saying here is that we found that the, the overhead of doing all of this with A-B tests was very expensive, which caused us to not iterate as much as we wanted on the content of our emails. So what we decided we needed to do was implement a system that has a kind of feedback loop that it doesn't have a person in the loop to constantly manage it. So what we did was we now take all of our tracking data, so things like users completing lessons, users clicking on emails, and we store that in a big data lake in S3. And then we take information about the emails we are sending, and we also store that as part of our data lake. Then every night we have an Amazon EMR job that goes through and processes all these data and checks which of our different options for our email subject or content is doing well, and then assigns every one of those a different score, which we then give back to the comeback service. Then when it's time to send a user an email, we check what email they've gotten recently, and then we combine that information with the scores we've created in order to decide what the best email to send that user on the given day is. So we could use, we can have certain heuristics, for example, as well, that say we don't want to send the email, the same, the user the same email they got sent yesterday for a practice reminder. Now, to give you an idea of how this works, imagine that we had four different candidate subject lines, these four on the screen. And since we don't necessarily know right away which one of these is going to be the best, we, all, we start by giving them all the same weight in our system. Then, over time, we might get information about how these different lines are performing, and then our multi-arm bandit model that we run in EMR will automatically update these weights to pick which ones are doing the best. So in this case, the got five minutes time for a tiny French lesson one is doing the best. And, but we have this one here down at the bottom that's not doing as well. But in this scenario, we don't necessarily want to abandon it. It might still be useful to keep sending this occasionally to users to see if users respond differently over time or we can exploit the novelty effect. And adding a new message is very easy. We just add it to the pool with some initial weight. And then the system will just figure out what the right answer is by checking out how that message does over time. So using this multi-arm bandit system that uses a feedback loop, we've been able to really iterate on our messages and kind of give users more, more variety in the ones they do see. And we found that this has increased our daily active users and improved user retention, especially for new users. Um, and we're also excited about this approach because this way of thinking about uh, how we change content is extensible to other areas as well. You can imagine using this in push notifications or other parts of the app where there's a, it's challenging to iterate on the exact content. All right, and finally, uh, I want to wrap up by throwing in a plug that uh, if any of this sounded interesting, we are hiring at Duolingo, so feel free to check out duolingo.com slash careers. But that's all for me, and I'm going to hand it off to Chris, who's going to talk about how Amazon.com uses SES.
Thank you. I'm uh, Christopher Bell. I'm a software development manager in uh, outbound marketing, which is a bit of a misnomer because we don't do just marketing. We will send uh, almost every email, push notification, SMS message that comes out of Amazon, and also all of the other sites that we have. So not only are we handling Amazon.com traffic, but it's a worldwide system. So uh, Amazon.com.br, .fr, .jp, everywhere and more. The challenges that this present is that all of our metrics systems and our reputation is tied to our from domain, which SES handles for us. And additionally, we look at all of the different uh, combinations of user experiences inside of these marketplaces. So on Amazon.com, a customer can uh, have English selected as their primary language, or they could have Spanish. In JP, it could be English, Chinese, or Japanese. And our email systems need to be compliant with those preferences. So what do we send? Uh, I hope that all of you have received these emails, uh, hopefully a lot of them in the last few days, for order confirmations. Um, and then we do special promotions. These are mostly marketing manager-created mails. So this is a human at Amazon that is building a mail and finding the right customers to send to this. And then we also have fully automated. And this represents the bulk of our mail uh, sending right now. So, and our goal is always to get to as uh, to 100% fully automated. Uh, we don't think that we'll ever achieve that goal. There's always going to be a place for some, some manual marketing. But at this point, we are um, pretty happy with where we're going with it. Uh, and these are your general retargeting mails. So you have looked at a soundbar recently, and uh, here are some other soundbars. Um, and then my team, Outbound Marketing, uh, goes beyond email as well. And so similar to what Duolingo mentioned is that we also do push notifications, SMS text messages, and the notification hub. So in the app, there's a bell icon, and this represents a persistent store for all of your push notifications. What we found was that customers would get their push notifications and then accidentally swipe to dismiss them, and then they were gone forever. Um, and so this allowed customers to be able to go back to it. And what, the way that we're organized is that any type of direct messaging to a customer falls into our, uh, our domain. And we use that as a, um, as a mechanism to allow us to coordinate messaging across these various different channels. So that's it. Even though we're doing all these other channels and we're very happy with them, email continues to be the, uh, the, the, the bulk of our, of our business and uh, will be expected to continue to be so in the future. So a little bit about our numbers. So every year, we send hundreds of billions of emails worldwide. Uh, that is the marketing emails that you receive. Those are your ship track and delivery confirmation mails, as well as some of the internal mails that we use. So we use these same systems and including SES for notifying uh, our internal employees that they haven't responded to a ticket in time and that they should go and respond to that ticket or if there is a particular problem with a, with a service. So we're using SES for both external uh, customer-facing mail as well as the internal ones. We support 80,000 plus templates or template components inside of our authoring tools. And for uh, our SES capacity, during peak days, we scale up to over 30,000 emails per second throughput for, for SES. Internally, we have retail and bulk sending partners. The, we have 1,600 plus different teams inside of uh, Amazon that are sending real-time mails. So this could be anything from gift cards to order confirmation to you are now eligible for a dollar credit for whatever. Um, and then we have a, a thousand people inside the company uh, on or off that are creating emails to go to all of our customers. We have 50 plus internal service dependencies, so we don't keep email addresses. Uh, we ping a service that holds them and then they return that information. We don't know what the picture is or the link to every picture for every product that we sold, so we ping another service to get all of that and we coordinate all of those internal service calls to actually render the mail itself. We have over 20 plus uh, email domains and we are sitting in four different AWS regions worldwide. Uh, so I thought I'd put a graph up here for what our daily uh, email volumes are in July 2019. We have a little event that we run called Prime Day 
And um, generally, we have a pretty, pretty steady mail volume. The blue line represents kind of that bulk transaction or that bulk processing marketing mail volume, where the green line is the shipment confirmations, password resets, and, and what have you. And uh, we, uh, we send a little bit of marketing mail on uh, July 16th and 17th this year. Um, I think Adir mentioned uh, tens of millions of emails a day. This represents uh, multiple hundreds of millions of emails being sent in a single day. But we're not steady throughout the whole day. So this graph is over Black Friday and uh, I think a couple days afterwards. And so we're pretty spiky. Um, we want to send very fast on, on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. And so we scale up and then we basically run at full capacity for several hours and then come back down. And we think speed is key on these peak days. Outside of peak, it's much more important that you send a mail to a customer when the customer is ready to actually receive the mail. All right, a little bit about our infrastructure. So we have bifurcated pipelines for real-time and bulk data uh, processing. Um, we start off with some manual marketing tools and partner services that dump a bunch of data into uh, a holding bucket. So at any given time, if you are a prime customer and you are active on the site, there could be 20, 30, 40 different emails waiting for you that we could send you at any given day. That's either our automated systems saying that there's content for you or this is a manual marketing manager that has decided that you really need to know about this thing. And so all of those get dumped into a, uh, a planner which uh, runs on EMR and that's what's used to decide which mail we should actually send you because you don't receive or you're not supposed to receive 20 emails from us in a day for marketing. Sometimes it may feel like that, but we do, we do try to limit it as much as possible. And then all of that is sent into our, our uh, separated EC2 fleet that we use for bulk data processing only. And then the second side is that we have the real-time fleet. And so we've got the 1,600 different partner services that are all calling in, and it's, it's uh, technically asynchronous, but functionally asynchronous transaction where they make a call to us, we do our governance rules and checks on it, and then we dump it off onto uh, SES. And we, separate, we have um, two different sets of IP pools per region for, for each of these. So the bulk processing, marketing heavy mails have their own dedicated IP space, and then the transactional mails have their own dedicated IP uh, space as well. And this helps us with our, with our reputation as well. And then SES takes it from there and manages the relationship with the ISPs and reports back to us on, on data like uh, bounces, hard or soft, or deliverability problems that may arise with any given ISP. So recently we had been um, kind of on a, a lag data model for returning events and we decided to shift to real-time event processing. And so what we did was we took all the email sends, opens, clicks, and other events. So this could be some on-site events. And then in real time, we return that data back into an EC, uh, EC2 fleet, which does a little bit of data enrichment if we need to, and then immediately dumps it onto Kinesis. And with that, once it's on Kinesis, we'll take a, uh, another the, a filtering EC2 fleet where we pull all of that data out of it and then distribute it and fan out. So we're just, we are serving a wide variety of internal partners, and they all have different needs. And so we don't want Prime Video to have to consume our entire data set to get real-time events. And so we do some filtering for them ahead of time. And so they can say, I only care about my emails. I'm like, well, okay, then I'm only going to send you your emails. And that's how we accomplish that. And then we have um, a, an archival Lambda that just kind of dumps... Uh, the metadata that we need to into uh, S3. And we're really excited about this. Um, while it's been done other places, this is my team's first use of Lambda at scale at hitting multiple tens of thousands of, of transactions per second. And so we're really fun. So I keep wanting to go serverless for everything because I never want to patch another box. Um, on, the on the fan out services, what we do for Prime Video that wants this data is that we 
provision an SNS topic for each customer that we want. And then we'll just dump the Prime Video Mails on one topic or the Prime Music on another topic or identity services. So if when you get your password reset, we want to know in real time that it's been delivered or opened and that you're getting the, the customer experience that we expect. And so we can dump all of that into there. And then on a uh, kind of like an audit basis, we've built another system just for uh, searching events that we have archived, which we run through Lambda, Athena, and Glue to end up extracting some of the metadata like delivered events for S3. Okay. So how do we decide what and when to send? I mentioned earlier that at any given time, uh, uh, an active prime customer can have 20, 30, 40 emails. So we do what probably a lot of everybody else does, is that we have some heuristics that we use to measure this. And we start off with the customer-centric uh, filter, so bounce filters. If an email is bounced, we, we pull that out. Purchase filters. If you haven't made any activity on the site, on any site on Amazon in the last one year or two year, we don't want to send to you, because there's a high risk of a bounce in that situation. So we want to email customers that are going to be engaged. We have cadence limits. So we don't want to send more than one or more than two marketing emails at any given time. And those are just hard limits. We have click rate thresholds. So I don't control every single email that is created. I don't control all the targeting. But I do control the governance. So if I'm noticing that there's a pattern of email that is coming from a certain area inside the site and it's got kind of like low click-through rates, we'll go ahead and cut that off. Same with opt-out thresholds. So we very closely track the number of opt-out clicks to clicks on the actual content in the mail. If we see those starting to come up, we'll terminate those mails. And open thresholds. So open rate is the key to everything. Right? After deliverability, if a customer doesn't open the mail, they can't click on anything and they can't get any value out of it. And then finally, at the very bottom of this, is that we look at objective performance. So after we've filtered everything else out and are only looking at the mails that have the right CTR, have the right open rate, then is when we look at, is this mail going to do what we think it's supposed to do? If we think it's going to result in incremental prime video streams, we, let, uh, we measure it that way. If we think that it's going to result in more sales for shoes, we'll look at it that way. And we'll compare those mails across everything else that we have. And for many years, this is how we have been doing our planning and our selection of our mails. And we continue to use these, but they're mostly guardrails now. And we're switching to machine learning for all of our mail uh, selection. So we look at an open engagement model, opt-out propensity models, click engagement models, send time models. And instead of just having guardrails, we can make a prediction about whether or not a customer will open, engage, or opt out on any given mails. And then we can set thresholds on those predicted scores. We also have send time and cadence modeling. With those, any time of uh, type of models that are doing that type of work, it's not complete without explore exploit. And that's always a challenge for us. So we can always build the model, but if we just let it sit there, it gets stale very quickly. And then finally, we do use objective propensity. So again, if you are trying to generate more prime video streams, more music streams, or more purchase in a given area of the site, we can consume objective propensity models that are built by other teams into consideration for how we're actually going to send what message where. What we found is that it's really effective. We were a little surprised by what ML was able to do for, for email. So by implementing these, we were able to reduce opt-out rates by 5 to 10, uh, 5 to 12%, varying by different uh, from domain. So Amazon.fr will have a little bit different performance than Amazon.com. We were able to increase open rates worldwide by over 300 bips. And this is, this is my favorite part about this. Well, mostly my favorite part. We can reduce send volume by 13%. But all of our objective function metrics showed no stat stig, stig, uh, change. So I can reduce volume by selecting the customers to not send emails to, and site-wide revenue stays the same, site-wide streams stay the same, site-wide activity stays the same, customer contacts do not go up, and 
This is all done on input metrics only. So this is clicks, opens, opt-outs, channel-wide. All right. This is completely agnostic to content. And so what, we, what we're excited to do in the future, it's content-specific ML models. Um, but we were, we were pleased that we were able to get results of this magnitude not having to know anything about the content. We, we know some, but we didn't use it as a, as a feature inside of the models. So for scaling for peak, uh, scaling for peak events, um, we nearly double our transactions per second during send times. Uh, we try to uh, play within 80% of our capacity limits during normal run times. As we are coming into peak, we work with SES and, and, and bring that up. And so we engage early and uh, look at our estimated capacity and send requirements worldwide and let, let SES know. And they, they will go and then warm up IPs for us for a couple months. Again, we'll have separate IPs for our marketing fleets as well as for our transactional fleets. And then they'll notify the ISPs of any expected increase in traffic. And so they're managing the relationship that we have with Google and Hotmail and, and whoever else. And finally, they'll, they'll escalate to an ISP when there's a problem. So in some of our real-time data processing, I can detect uh, open rates by ISP in real time. And today, we are doing that on a, on a daily cadence, and we'll escalate to SES. So I am uh, sending tens of millions of mails a day to almost every major ISP on the planet. And if we detect an open rate problem, we'll, we'll escalate to SES, and then they can solve that problem for us. And if we're having the problem, chances are other SES customers may as well. So we're trying to get ahead of that to increase deliverability for every SES partner. And finally, we use SES's hard and soft uh, bounce data to refine our customers. So if you're bouncing, we're not going to send you emails. All right, and with that, I'll bring Kadir back up to uh, discuss deliverability. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan and Chris talked about how they are using Amazon SES to scale and send emails, millions of emails every day. But how do you land those emails in the inbox? So you are sending emails at scale, but if your customers are not receiving that email, then it, there is no uh, impact for your business. Before we go into what are the key factors we look at, I want to debunk some of the uh, email deliverability myths out there. Number one, mailbox providers like Hotmail and Gmail they are under no obligation to place your emails in the inbox. Their customers, their priority is placing the emails that their customers want in their inbox. If I am actively engaging with the brand, if I am actively looking at reading the email, their priority, their algorithms will place the emails for that I am actively engaging with in the inbox rather than any emails that anyone sends. Uh, pretty much more than 80% of the emails that they receive are getting dropped altogether. And there are key things that, you, that they consider to make that uh, judgment. Uh, their algorithm looks at many things. A uh, few of them are IP addresses and the domain that you send emails, and also the content of the email. And the content of the e email directly relates to the engagement of your customers, whether your customer is engaging, whether they are opening the email. Yeah, an email that might land in the inbox for me might not land in the inbox for someone else. It might be in the junk. More and more Gmail and Hotmail and other ISPs are going towards a model where they are placing in mails in the inbox based on the engagement of a particular user, not across the board. And there is no one magic bullet for email deliverability. You need to work through the data. Uh, Chris and Jonathan has talked about how they look at the data, multiple uh, variables to optimize their sending so their customers are engaging with it. Once the customers are engaging, only then you will start to get the emails to land in the inbox for them. Like Chris mentioned, you can reduce the emails, uh, the number of emails that you send, but if you keep sending emails to the effective customers, you will see better investment. And it's a shared responsibility, landing emails. So Amazon SES, we will maintain our service, we will give you features, we will give you ability to measure and monitor your sending and how your customers are engaging. We also expect as a customer you to use those metrics to understand what your customers are doing and remediate any problems you have. And few of those problems arises from key areas and one of them is uh, IPs. As an Amazon SES customer, by default, when you start sending emails, your emails will go through shared IP 
pools. The shared IP pools, multiple customers will use the IP, and the reputation of those IPs depend on everyone else who is using those IPs. Uh, so if you have a bad sender, that might impact your reputation as well, the IP reputation as well. So instead of, if you want to isolate your IP reputation, we recommend you to get dedicated IPs. When you use dedicated IPs, the reputation of the IP is solely dependent on your sending. Whether you are sending good emails, the IP will be good, and as long as you keep it warmed up, that means you are sending emails continuously at a regular cadence. And when you start sending emails, you can lease more than one or more than one IPs with us. Uh, we have customers who are using uh, hundreds of IPs as well. And as you start using them, you need to automatically warm them up, slowly warm them up. The warm up is a, a mechanism where you are sending emails one at a time or slowly through a new IP. Because when a ISV, like Gmail or Hotmail, when they receive emails from an unknown IP, then they will start uh, uh, throttling them. They don't know it. They don't trust those IPs. So you need to slowly warm them up. And we have a feature called automated warm up, uh, warming up of IPs, IPs, and we will do that for you. And when you have, if your email sending is simple use cases like just uh, notifications of a transaction or newsletters, then you might not be, you might not benefit from creating multiple pools. But you have mix of use cases or mix of different various uh, email programs like re-engagement of your users or marketing and transactional and sending it from one account, we recommend you to create multiple pools. So you are sending emails, uh, a particular type of email from a particular pool. What that does is it will eliminate the any reputation issues coming from one pool of IPs on the other pool. For example, your transaction emails uh, will not get affected by your re-engagement e emails. And once you start sending emails, you have your uh, infrastructure optimized, you start sending emails, then you need to start monitoring your sending. You need to see how your customers are engaging with the emails. The tracked feedback is really important. You have seen in the uh, Jonathan's and also Chris's talk, they spend a lot of time talking about how they are optimizing their sending, how they are measuring the data. It is really important that you know that, that you understand the customers. And you can track it at a global level, account level, uh, for all, all your sending, or you can go into granular feedback, uh, granularly track feedback by different email sending programs. Uh, when customers ask me, what should I do? Should I just track it at a granular level, or should I track it at an account level or a global level of all your sending? I, the answer is it depends. It, it's not a cop-out, but it's mostly around how their email sending is. If they have multiple programs, multiple teams within the same company sending emails, it's easier to troubleshoot, easier to uh, get to the root cause of a deliberate issue if you start tracking those emails at a granular level. That means you, are, you know which group is sending what email or which particular campaign is giving you uh, uh, the results. And with Amazon SES, you can do that with a concept called configuration set. Configuration set is a group of settings uh, such as open and click tracking, what domains you want to use there, or the IP pools you want to use to send emails. So you give that a name, and that's configuration set. So when you send emails, you apply that configuration set, and then when we receive that request, we will look at that, and then we understand what settings we want to apply, and then we apply it when you send it. And you will get the feedback based on those configuration sets as well. You can create a configuration set using our console, our UI, which is much easier than this, or you can do it via APIs or through our SDKs or CLI. We are not going to go into much detail here. This is a sample code snippet from our API documentation, but I want to highlight this because it, this is a particular section talks about event destination, which is how you are getting the, uh, how you will receive the metrics through Amazon SES. So tracking, now that we realize, okay, we want to start tracking, we, uh, depending on the programs, we want to start tracking them a little bit more granularly. What are the things that you need to track at a high level? Number one is tracking bones and complaints. Bones is an invalid email address or an email address which, is, which has a typo or not being used. Uh, so if you keep sending it, the mailbox providers will assume you are just auto-generating email addresses and then you are not, you don't have a, a, a list that is very hygienic. Uh, that means you are not having a, a current list and it's an old list, and they will start picking your reputation. The same as complaints. When someone, when one of your recipients press a junk button and then say, 
okay, I don't like this email, then that's a complaint. So what we want you to do is you, we recommend you to receive those metrics and remove those users. With Amazon SES, you can do that uh, by different events. Uh, when you start sending emails, we give you multiple events, starting with, hey, we received your email, we sent that email, we delivered it, which, which means we hand it off to the ISPs, uh, all the way to as bones and compliance. And we give you that through Kinesis Data Firehose or Amazon SNS or Amazon CloudWatch. You can receive those events there and you can process them. Once you receive them, we, we recommend you to remove that recipient from your list that you manage and don't send them email again. Or you can start using Amazon's new feature, which is a account level separation list. We launched this feature last week. So by new account, by default, it's enabled. So when you, when you send an email, if the email bounces or if you receive a complaint, then we will put that in your separation list. So when you try to send emails again to that particular email address, we will block it. We won't send that email again. And you can remove the email address in your separation list or you can add them if you're moving from a different provider to SES or you're moving away from your own sending to uh, your own management of the separation list to us, you can use you can e import them as well and you can e export them as well. So with this feature, we handle the bounce management and complaint management for you and you don't have to do the heavy lifting. The last piece where you want, we recommend uh, you to start tracking is the engagement of your users. When you, as the mailbox providers are moving more towards the engagement model where an email might land in inbox for me, not for you, it is really important to understand whether your customers are engaging. And you do that by using open and clicks as a proxy metric. It's a proxy metric for your uh, content as well, whether your content is relevant, your uh, customers are engaging with your content, and also whether they are taking actions on email, whether they open it and they're not taking any action. So you can start using that to measure engagement. And many of our sophisticated customers, like Duolingo, they not just use the email metric, but they also use the app as well, and the, every other property they have, the push notifications, SMS notifications that they receive, uh, the app opens and the performance of the apps, they use all that to get a, a holistic view of their users and they use it to maintain their list and then they prune it to keep it very active and then they send the emails or messages to only the active users. And the rule of thumb is how long you need to keep something in the list. It depends, again, the answer is it depends, but many of our customers use a 12-month model where if a customer is not engaged for 12 months, they remove them from the list. But if you are sending emails every three months, once in three months, uh, it might not work out 12 months, you might need it longer, or if you're sending emails every day and if you're not engaging, then you need to look at a shorter deadline as well. So there are a lot of data to process, a lot of things to uh, to to input the deliverability, but you don't know whether it's actually working or not. Yeah, and also you don't know where you stand. That's why we we launched this feature last year called the deliverability dashboard. What deliverability dashboard does is it gives you a holistic view of your sending. It gives you a, a inbox placement rate, the rate at which an email is landing in the inbox versus it's going into the spam by ISPs. It also monitors your dedicated IPs on your domain for IP blacklisting as well. So we we let you know whether your IP address is in a blacklist. And also, in conjunction to that predictive inbox placement test, before you send an email, do you, uh, we will give you a predictive score on how the ISPs might treat that email as well. And with all this, you can take more preemptive actions and, and not get into this uh, issue where uh, you start sending campaigns and then you are starting to see the impact. You can be more proactive. The first one is a inbox level placement metric where we give you the placement, uh, for example, for this one, it's 82 percentage uh, inbox placement rate. And then you can measure it across uh, top ISPs. We also give you this information by regional ISPs as well. And you can measure it across a longer time frame. Uh, and you can spot the trends, whether in the last 30 days or 90 days, whether your in inbox placement has improved or dropped. So you can use it to continuously measure. We not only provide the inbox placement rate, but also as part of this, we also give you the read rate, the read and delete rate or deleted rate, so you know whether the customers, they just open it. Okay, my open rate went up, but then they just delete it immediately. You know that they are not finding it useful. So we give that information as well, so for you to un under understand how it is doing. This is at a domain level. You don't have to use SES 
to, uh, to get this information. As long as you have a domain that you verify on a SES account, you get this information. You can use your own uh, infrastructure you, or you can use other ISVs, uh, but as long as you verify the domain, we give this information for you. And there's another uh, uh, area we launched, a new feature we launched this year as part of this, is visualizing or giving this information by a campaign level. Last year, one of our customers ran a re-engagement program which made their whole reputation to go down overnight because of the, uh, the particular campaign. So when you look at it from a domain level, you won't be able to get into that detail or troubleshoot faster. So we started giving this uh, information by a campaign level so you know it's like how your campaign is performing so you can take action on it. And this data is available via API, so you can consume it, and you can put it on your uh, uh, dashboards like QuickSight or uh, Kibana, or you can visualize it through our console. The second piece of this particular feature set, the suite of features, is a, a IP uh, and domain blacklisting. So if you're sending deteriorate the, the spam listing, uh, the nonprofits that monitor the, uh, the sending health globally, they will add your email. Uh, IP address or the domain address to that list. So what happens is when you receive, when you send an email, the ISVs, uh, they look at the uh, list, compare it against it, and, and if your email is in that list, they will drop your email. So you're not even reaching the mailbox providers, it will get dropped along the way even before it reaches them. So we monitor that for you, we will look at the, uh, the deliberate events and then we will monitor it and then we will give you that information. And the predictive inbox placement rate, like I mentioned briefly before, you can use it to understand how your emails will do before you send the campaigns. You can use it as a baseline to see how your campaign will perform and you can start measuring it and then you can start improving it. Or, or if it goes below a particular the predictive score that we gave you, you can start uh, uh, stop passing your uh, campaigns as well. And then we send it to uh, major uh, email providers across the world so there's a fair chance all the I mean, we, we do cover all the major providers and regional providers, so uh, the email sending will be a representation of your uh, actual sending. And all these events, the deliberate events and everything else can happen anytime. Uh, like I mentioned, one of my customers, they did a, a re-engagement campaign and then it, it affected overnight. Uh, there was also another customer who had their IPs bl uh, blacklisted overnight. So if you don't constantly monitor it, then it will become an issue for you and then it will drop your deliverability. So how do you prevent that? So we started to add alarms for you. So you know if a certain threshold, if, if an IP gets blacklisted, you will get an email address or, I mean, an email or a, a SMS notification. If, a, if your inbox placement rate goes below a threshold, a particular threshold, then you will you can also alarm yourself to understand why that is happening, either by domain or by a campaign, a particular one as well. And you can do that by ISVs. You can say, I don't worry about, I'm not going to worry about uh, the regional ISP providers. I'm going to worry about the top three or top four. Then you can set alarms by them as well. So you will get notification. And all this is a lot of data, right? This is all a lot of data. This is a lot to interpret, a lot to do. And it takes a lot of expertise to do that. And we have seen a lot of our customers, when they uh, look at the data, they, they start interpreting on their own, and then they try so many different things, sometimes that invariably create more damage than the problem they're trying to solve. So it's a lot of, it requires expertise. So that's why we partnered up with leading email uh, delivery experts to, to create a program for SES users. We have onboarded them, they know more about Amazon SES, they know how SES works, the features that we provide, uh, and also how you can take advantage of it. So it, these providers, they will, you can engage them on your own. Uh, they know how to work with us, they know how uh, Amazon SES works, and they, they will help you leverage, and then interpret the data for you. They can help you engage uh, for a one-time engagement, or you can have them engage across the board for like a longer engagement for six months or one year, or continuous engagement to continuously improve it. The deliverability is a continuous improvement. It's not one-time fix. You always have to monitor it. It needs a lot of investment as well. And if you're really, in, if you're interested more about a deliverability and how you want to improve your deliverability, we have a chalk talk on Thursday at Aria at noon. So please do come join us there. So it's it's more of a Q&A session where we can go more in depth and we can discuss more about how you can improve the deliverability. And 
with that, thank you very much for uh, attending the session today. Uh, like I mentioned, it's a shared responsibility that deliberately I'm sending the emails. So please take advantage of our features and also work with us to improve your deliberately. Uh, Chris, Jonathan, and I will be available off the stage for any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you.